I think we can go ahead and get started. It looks like we have a good amount of folks joining. Thanks so much for being here with us this morning. My name is Emily Buer. I'm with CAF, Community Alliance with Family Farmers, and I manage our ecological farming program. And today we are going to be talking about cover cropping and orchards, um, really with an emphasis on, on benefits for pollinators, for soil health, as well as for beneficials. And, um, you know, we'd love to be able to meet in the field today, but really the next best thing is to, you know, meet online and, and that way we can, you know, connect with each other across the state or across the country even. Um, and so today's event really is, to, is does designed to be kind of a mix of an online demonstration as well as um, a presentation and we'll have time for a discussion around cover cropping and um, the use of hedgerows in orchards. And today actually uh, is our first event as part of the Sacramento Valley Technical Assistance Hub. And we're very excited to um, have a partnership between CAF, between local Sacramento Valley Resource Conservation Districts, um, the National Center for Appropriate Technology and UC Cooperative Extension. And our aim for this hub really is to connect growers um, with resources and information that helps make, you know, soil implementing these kinds of conservation practices and soil health practices more accessible. And so, you know, one of the best ways to do this is really to provide opportunities for growers to, uh, to meet and, and to talk, you know, over various platforms in person or online. Um, as well as with experts to, you know, really share their experiences. Um, so we're going to be having a series of, of online and in-field events beginning uh, this summer and through the next spring. And, you know, through this, be able to, to really connect and um, share experiences. So if you would like to get plugged into the, the Sacramento Valley TA Hub, we'll be sharing more information later about how to do that. And just a few items for housekeeping. So uh, you can go ahead and, and tell us where you're from. We'd love to, to hear where folks are coming from. Um, you can go ahead and pop that in the chat if you'd like to. And you can also use the chat for more general questions, um, you know, just to talk to one another. If you have specific tech questions or, um, you need, you know, technical assistance, you can uh, reach out to, to Rose, who is our CAF tech person, and she can help you out. And also, if you would like to ask questions of our speakers today, you can go ahead and just use the Q&A, which is uh, at the bottom of your screen. And at the end, we'll have an opportunity for discussion um, with our two speakers. And so with that, uh, today we are going to hear from Ben King of Pacific Gold Agriculture, who is going to be sharing about his experiences cover cropping um, in his orchards, as well as Rex DeFore of NCAT, who has also a lot of experience working with, with growers who cover crop. And they'll be sharing about a, a joint project that is ongoing. Um, looking at you know, the impacts of cover crops and hedgerows on insect populations. So we're very excited to learn more. And thank you both Ben and Rex for being here with us today. Um, ben, would you like to you know, introduce yourself and, and give just a little bit of background? Sure. <clears throat> my name's Ben King and <clears throat> my company's named Pacific Gold Agriculture, but uh, my, my farming heritage goes back to 1860. Uh, we actually have 350 acres of almonds that we have been having crops for about five, six years. And then uh, for this project, we have about 300 acres of pecans. And I, I grew up in Clusa. My family said uh, orchard at the edge of Clusa. It was actually an old orange orchard, which now is a pecan orchard since the um, early 1900s. And um, um, I was really, I, when I grew up, I spent a lot of time uh, on this. Sacramento River in the river jungles and um, that was something that uh, uh, kind of impacted me informed me and then my brother's a beekeeper so I've had a, a real passion for the riparian habitat of the river and also pollinators and a couple years back um, environmental defense fund 
um, actually approached me and wanted to see if we were interested in trying to provide a pollinator or monarch habitat within a pecan orchard. And we have a young pecan orchard outside of, of Calusa um, that uh, we've been establishing and, and um, we thought it was a great project. And through that, um, we've been on this journey of really intense cover cropping uh, and trying to use beneficials uh, for uh, aphid control with pecans, but also uh, carbon sequestration and for um, uh, nitrogen fixation, all the multi-benefit approach. And uh, it's been a great project. Um, we've been fortunate to meet Rex at NCAT and the work they're doing and then Emily um, you know, frankly, I just I, I want to say that I think uh, CAF's doing it's really a real need to have a hub because there's so many people who are doing different projects, uh, a lot of people with good ideas and good intentions and really the key is bring it together. So thanks for the opportunity for to be part of this panel. Great. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, yeah, Rex, would you like to go ahead and give a little bit of a background and introduce your work? Sure. Um, my name is Rex Dufour. I work for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we have um, an office in California, which I opened in 2001, uh, but our, we're, it's a national nonprofit, so our head office is in Butte, Montana. We have an office in Texas and Arkansas, Mississippi, and uh, New Hampshire. So um, my involvement when and NCAT manages something called the ATRA project, which is a national sustainable ag information service. And so we provide information free of charge to farmers around the country. It's a really good resource for beginning or experienced farmers. Um, and I've been working with NCAT for about 30 years now, 25, 30 years. Um, and just learning from farmers and passing that information on uh, about more ecological approaches to agriculture. Particularly, my background is uh, in pest management and entomology, but I've learned soils uh, quite a bit as well. I have a master's in IPM from UC Riverside. Um, so we learn from farmers trying, uh, and we've learned a lot from this project. And I was involved in this project through meeting uh, Dan Kaiser of the Environmental Defense Fund. And, he was concerned about monarchs, um, as we, as a lot of us are. Uh, monarchs are kind of a canary in the coal mine kind of population, and when their population crash, crashes, who knows what population crash is coming up next. So um, we wanted to provide a little bit more habitat for them. The con seemed ideal in this context. Um, they're grown in riparian areas. Um, they do very well in uh, seasonally flooded soils due to the curious fact that they do not have root hairs. And so they are not immune, but probably very, very, very resistant to phy Phytophthora urot. Anyway, that's kind of a tangent. Um, but we've been working with Ben and Pat Gold uh, for, the, for last year and um, going to do the same thing this year, monitoring the cover crop and, and what goes up into the pecan canopy. And um, I'll present uh, some of the information we found uh, later in the seminar. So thank you. Thank you, Rex. Yeah, thank you both. We appreciate you both being here and being able to share your expertise. And so now we're gonna have a chance to see and learn more about um, you know, this cover cropping work in, this, in the pecan orchard at uh, Ben King's in Calusa. So I believe we have a, a slideshow with some photos and videos um, to, to show everybody to get kind of more of a sense of what that looks like. Rose, would you be able to share that with us? All right, is everyone able to see that? Looks like we're queuing it up for everybody. All right. Yeah. And I'll let Ben, I'll let you take it away. Yeah. So um, we, uh, so last year, um, 
uh, NCAT and EF uh, gave us a seed mix to plant. And so we planted that um, in 2020 um, during part of the year, early in the growing season. And so what you see before us is um, this is probably a, a photo, let's say in April, I imagine, uh, March, April, and it's the clover and you see the peak going down in between um, these are nine-year-old pecans, uh, so they're still growing. Um, so there's room in between the rows, um, but, uh, uh, and then you see the clover mix there. Um, and um, the key about, pe one thing about pecans is that um, they're, they're a nut crop and they're deciduous like all nuts. They come out uh, about the same time as walnuts. And so you have, um, uh, you don't have a, a, a canopy until uh, basically a walnut canopy. Um, and um, they actually harvest after walnuts. So we'll be harvest. This is a, a variety. It's primarily Pawnee, which is a little bit earlier maturing variety um, that we chose because of, of a seasonal flooding um, and wet, some hopefully, usually wet winters. But, uh, um, um, but, but uh, the, the key is, is that we actually, you know, while Almonds will be past bloom and full leaf canopy. Pecans, pecans and walnuts will just be coming out. And so it really does give you uh, the chance for a cover crop to, um, to really merge and, and, and start blooming and provide them pollinator habitat uh, throughout the spring. And so um, this, um, the other thing is that pecans, these pecans are on sprinklers and most pecan orchards are on sprinklers. So we're able to bring water uh, to the whole orchard floor. And so that's great also for the establishment and the maintenance of a cover crop. And um, we were just amazed with, with the clover. Um, we had, uh, the field is, in bright, is divided in five different blocks depending on age and location. And we had these two blocks that we didn't do anything with that we seeded the prior year and were disappointed with the emergence we had. And then lo and behold, in February, where all of a sudden this clover started coming up and the yara and the puppy started coming up and the seeds had to be there for two years, but it just, they, uh, they, it was just uh, rows of magnificent clover. So um, this is beginning of a kind of pollinator um, jum jumboree, you know, um, you'll, as you'll see these pictures. Um, so this is uh, the a younger side, and this is actually a little bit later in the year. Some of the clover has already started to go to seed, but uh, that's a, a block that actually uh, is a younger block. I think this is a four. This is our block that's uh, about four years old. But um, we still have um, the cover crop in our orchard. Uh, we've mowed a little bit just a couple rows just to see but we've decided um we decided the best way to manage this actually is to roll the cover crop rather than cut it which means we have a lot more habitat for the beneficials and we're hoping to promote the uh the clover the, the maturity seed maturity of the clover um and we get the mulching effect uh of from from the cover crop but uh, actually provide Kind of the air between uh, between the um, soil and and the cover crop, which I think that area is just uh, just a lot of bug activity, a lot of beneficial activity. And then this is um, uh, you know this is a little bit. Here's just a picture of. Uh, when I think Emily was out in the orchard. And when was that, Emily? When were you out? That was in uh, mid, yeah, mid-May, just about yeah. a month ago. Yeah. So you can just see um, how much is going on out there from uh, from ha pollinator habitat um, and carbon sequestration, sequestration, you know, and basically, um, uh, it, it just, there's just a lot, this is a younger, this is the younger, one of the younger blocks. This is about seven year old trees, but um, uh, we're just, we just have a lot going on from clovers to a different other type of, um, of, of our seed mix. And, and the difference now is that we've just actually just rolled this, uh, but um, we have all that, uh, we'll all be reincorporated back in the soil, so.
And then this is another picture of what we we have. And this is the um, this is the the Yara. Is that right? Vasilia. Vasilia. I'm sorry, Vasilia. So, and we have good. We had good crop of Yara, and we had some poppies out there too. And then we have our. Blood it's flower. not letting me go forward anymore. Um, I wonder. And then you can see a lady beetle on that right there, one of those, one of those facilias. All right. Well, we do have more photos and videos to share, but we'll see if Rose can get that kind of um, back up for everybody. And I guess in the meantime, um, one question I had, Ben, I know you said that you're you're rolling, you know, at the end of the season. Yeah. Do you mow at any point? And if yeah, you're... so last year, last year what we did was we. So I think the, the one of the, one of the things is that uh, in my experience doing cover cropping, and it, it depends when you're just dealing with drip, you're really just dependent on when it rains and when you plant. And so that's been our experience in almonds. But in the pecan, since we have the sprinklers. Um, we're going to have a cover crop. So then the question is, what's the best way to manage it? Um, and at the end of harvest, um, pecans are you know, just there's more pictures of the clover. Um, so you just see how much stuff is going on out there. But at the end of harvest, pecans are harvested like walnuts. So they're, they're um, sh shook out of the trees and then they're um, putting windrows on the, you know, we windrows on the uh, ground and then picked up like walnuts and set to a holler dryer. And so that happens um, sometime in late October. So between now and late October, we need to have a bed that we actually can rake the pecans uh, off the, away from the tree rolls and sweep them and, and pick them up. Um, and, and one thing to note about pecans, because they're harvested in late October and some varieties are harvested even in January, um, we do need a, a, a turf um, because when it does rain in California, it can get quite muddy and it's hard to get access to the, to the orchard floor. So the, at the end, at some point between now, between, between the time the cover crop emerges and harvest, we do a mow. Um, but what uh, but mowing um, has a couple things. One, it uh, it it takes uh, tractors and people uh, to mow, and so if you don't have to mow, that's great. Um, but one reason to mow is actually to you know here we have solid set sprinklers, is to get access and see if sprinklers are being. Uh, weeds are rock blocking them and just maintenance for our irrigation system. Um, we're thinking about making organic transition here, but we're, we're not at this point. Uh, we are using um, you know, nitrogen fertilizer, and so we apply that. Uh, and then we're also spraying around the, the trees themselves, and so we need access to that. So the question is, how do we get access to our tree rows, but um, minimize our input costs and maximize the cover crop? And so last year, we tried this idea of of basically keeping the cover crop as long as we could. And I believe we, we went into June. Uh, we had done the first mow by this time last year. Um, and then we let one side of the orchard grow up and then uh, of the one side of the road grow back. And then the then we would mow the other side and did that, um, let's say every three, four weeks until harvest. Mm -hmm. So this year, um, I, I really am amazed about this clover. So I thought to myself, well, how do I um, uh, get, get the orchard, how do we get the orchard access we need, but also have a chance for this clover to reseed? Because I think that's the key here is get a, basically a perennial that can reseed. And then um, you have all the benefits of, of, of the cover crop without having to actually reseed each year, because that's disruptive itself. And so we've, we've, we've um, rolled. And it, so far, it seems like, you know, it, it's we got all the access we need. And then the other thing that happens is that this clover, depending on the variety, 
tends to get pretty heavy, and especially when we're spring when sprinklers on it, it kind of drops anyhow. So, so this is just something that we've improvised on. It was an idea that just had, and so far I'd say um, it it seems like it's doing the job. And so, oh, we um, there will be some trade offs maybe with how we're managing Bermuda and maybe some Johnson grass seed, but. Um, you know, there's always trade-offs, but on the whole, I think so far I'm pretty encouraged. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I yeah, Rex, yeah. Oh, you want me to get comments, Rex, on that? No, I think you you covered it pretty well. It's um, you know, this year's cover crop is you, this year's cover crop was all drilled last year because it was kind of the experimental year. We drilled some yeah. of the cover and broadcast some of the cover. And I'll be talking about the list of species and um, okay. what did well and what didn't. And I have some pictures from last year too. And matter of fact, my the background here, this is from uh, the cover crop in, in your orchard then. So, but it was from April, oh. April of last year. Okay, yeah. Very nice. Yeah, thank you for, for explaining that in more detail. Um, and can you talk a little bit about you know some of what's in this mix i believe there was is it was it rose clover and maybe some crimson clover was coming through as well yeah i, I think i yeah i'd refer to i we ba basically planted the seeds that rex gave us so why don't red to rex talk about our mix sure sure um we had a uh a pretty diverse seed mix of um we had cayuse oats a couple of grasses, creeping wild rye and cayuse oats, and then three clovers. There's red clover, uh, Persian clover, and crimson clover. And, uh, you know, we developed this mix in collaboration with Ben and some other folks. Uh, we we're just kind of tossing ideas around. But uh, the Persian clover, you know, when you're out there, it, it has a really nice uh, smell to it. And it's, it's amazing when you go out in April and May to these covers, um, compared to an orchard floor with nothing on it, it's just vibrant with life. Um, so aside from the clovers and the grasses, we planted some forbs, uh, notably showy milkweed. Uh, these were broadcast last year, showy, narrow, narrow leaf milkweed, um, yarrow, California poppy, sweet alyssum, and phacelia. And Facilia did quite well. The California poppy and the alyssum, they kind of grew in that ecotonal area between the tree row where the herbicides are sprayed and the alley where the cover crop is really heavy in the center, but there's a little bit more light on the outsides. Uh, so some of the less aggressive plants like California poppy and sweet alyssum uh, popped up there. And as Ben had mentioned, uh, the yarrow, didn't see much yarrow the first year, but this year, especially in the northern blocks, blocks one and two, uh, it must have spent all last year establishing roots yeah. because it really popped up early. It was, an, I wouldn't have expected yarrow to be an early bloomer, but it was, uh, you know, April and May. So that that was one of those interesting little tidbits we learned from this, you know. Got to be patient. Sometimes they don't show up till year two. That's some um, Persian clover. It's great. And the foreground, that's a seed head of uh, crimson clover. Oh, um, I mentioned we did a couple milkweed uh, species. They didn't show up at all. <laughs> so we didn't include them in the seed mix this, this year. At bypass farms, they did show up a little bit. Um, don't know why other than uh, we had a pretty dense canopy of the clovers early on and probably that might have inhibited germination of the milkweeds. So this is all speculation. Yeah, and I think bypass, so the project with Environment Fence Fund uh, it comes to about 300 acres and we provided 250 acres of that and then the other 50 acres was with bypass farms um, close to um, the confluence of the American and the Sacramento rivers right on the other side, uh, I guess directly 
just north of the uh, west the of the uh, north of the airport. Yeah, I always get my distances, and uh, I think they actually uh, planted um, uh, it, it, the, their young orchard. They have drip, and so I think that's one that was maybe one advantage, and that they didn't get the kind of the water that our cover crop got, but um, they also was they didn't get the disturbance um, possibly in the middle of rows. Well, you know, it was a new so orchard, much, much younger than your orchards, Ben. Yeah, yeah. But um, they actually had micro sprinklers because- uh, Oh, they did, okay. For the first few sweeps, uh, we consistently hit the same day as they were irrigating. <laughs> so okay. Doing sweeps yeah, well, and a heavy cover crop with micro sprinklers going is uh, yeah. Yeah. better okay. to wear a wetsuit or something. I did, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I think that's the thing is that you just don't know. It's so, it's so- it's like a crop and uh, it, it's, you don't know how it's all, a lot of it's timing in the year and stuff. So it's, it's key, you want to get it out there and then you go forward and you learn from the process. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we, we have a couple photos up here also of there was some milkweed um, that was planted as hedgerows. Could you touch a little bit on, on the hedgerows? Uh, and how that's been going? Yeah, so um, this year we plant ahead rows. We have some uh, rows within the orchard that actually uh, there's a natural gas line that runs through there and that we have um, uh, have not planted trees on top of it. And so that was ideal within the orchard because it gets the sprinklers um, actually keep the help of establishment. So we planted in the orchard rows and then the re remainder is on the outside of the orchard uh, which we've established, uh, we're running, going to run drip to it, but right now we're just tanking it and then um, managing weeds around that. So we're in a part of orchard establishment of it, but it's it's next to irrigation ditch um, of, from our neighbors. It should should do very well over time. And this orchard is closed. So you know, as I mentioned again, it's like I have a you know, the passion for the riparian kind of the riparian forest and my intent here was basically use pecans because uh, they can, uh, they do fine in the flooded areas and seasonally flooded areas. Um, but um, uh, there's this orchard in particular has just uh, so much going on. I mean, between pheasants and deer and mountain lions and uh, in the yeah. winter time, we have sandhill cranes come into the orchard, um, uh, actually going after gophers and, um, but uh, it's it's an area where basically um, it's very vi vibrant, and so um, but the the hedgerows are going to be just part of the natural vegetation around the around the perimeter or the orchard. So it's kind of uh, you know have more targeted. Otherwise, you'd have just different type of vegetation. But this the hedgerows will be targeted for pollinator habitat and hopefully monarchs. Mm -hmm. Right, and once you know, once that cover crop is is kind of dried down, you'll have some additional habitat. Yeah, your different nectary sources, that kind of a thing. Yeah, right? and 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 I would say then that's you know um, I, that is something really kind of to highlight too. I think one thing that you see in you know in California in a Mediterranean climate uh, is that you know first of all it's like uh, you know we get our rain I and mean, we do have rainy years and and during the winter months. And then things dry up, but the riparian areas, because of the water holding capacity of the of the natural levees, you know, always probably stay greener longer. Uh, and then uh, you have, you know, traditionally fed wa some water sources, um, natural uh, water sources. But when you you know irrigate agriculture, um, one benefit of irrigate agriculture in the Mediterranean climate is that you can bring water to the soil and get all the multi benefits from it. And so in this case, um, because of the irrigation ditches next to us, it, it provides, um, you know, that habitat through this, through these, through the year, but probably the most pressure for pollinators in particular is that time period, um, say September into the first rain, um, because, you know, all the, all the, all the crops have been harvested, like tomato fields are kind of barren, the almonds have been harvested, you know, um, and, and everything needs to be prepped for, for um, 
uh, harvest and the middle rows are not as, you know, we even us will not have the, the benefit of cover crops in the middle rows that time of year. And so you do need that, 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 that habitat and that's where the hedgerows can come in. And then just any, any, any natural vegetation too around irrigation infrastructure and ditches and stuff is a really valuable part. And in my opinion, it'd be kind of more of a natural riparian habitat too, so. Yeah, it's so interesting to see. And I wish I wish we had some of the audio from these videos. Um, there really was a lot of life, you know, happening and, and bees buzzing around and, and birds. Um, yeah, lots of birds is really lovely to see. So yeah, thank you so much, Ben, for sharing. Um, and I think next we're going to hear from Rex to learn more about the the monitoring that's been done in the last last year or so. Um, so Rex, I'll let you go ahead and, and share more. Hey, thank you. And I'm just gonna let's see. Share screen. Can you see that? Yes, yeah, we're able to see that. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to turn off my video uh, just because uh, I've gotten these pop-up windows saying my internet connection is unstable. So I'm just going to reduce the chances of um, it going blank. So, um, so I'm going to be talking today about what we found in the past year in some of the cover crops planted in the pecan orchard uh, and the impacts on aphid populations and uh, also, what uh, we try to monitor some of the beneficial populations as well. So, uh, got a bunch of pictures, got a bunch of graphs about populations, uh, various kinds. Please feel free to just, um, oops, sorry, I have to go back. Um, this work, uh, we collaborated with an Environmental Defense Fund, but they were the ones that applied to the California Wildlife Conservation Board for funds. And I uh, sure appreciate um, Ben King. It's been a pleasure working with, with Ben King and his uh, farm manager, Mike Powell. They're both very flexible and creative thinkers. And uh, that's a really good thing to have in a farmer, I think. So the project goals, I just wanted to cover this. Um, we wanted to establish habitat for beneficials, including monarchs. Uh, and pecans are uniquely suited to this, as Ben said. Uh, they have such a long growing season, harvest being about four to five weeks after walnut harvest. Uh, so a diverse set of cover crops could be planted and allowed to flower, go to seed. Um, and in this situation, the cover crops were being used as a biointensive pest management technique. So, uh, but that's not all they bring, you know, all those. It was a pretty lush cover crop last year and uh, looks like the same this year, the slightly different um, mixtures, um, but that kind of cover crop has uh, water infiltration benefits, uh, nitrogen fixation benefits, water storage in the soils. And uh, woman Lauren Hale of USDA ARS, uh, Agricultural Research Service, was monitoring the soil dynamics and the fungal and bacterial populations. And I'm really, I keep on pestering her about, you know, well, when are you gonna come out with something? Because uh, she said she found some interesting information. Uh, we also wanted to monitor and identify beneficials coming to the cover crop and those migrating up into the canopy. Uh, we wanted to monitor aphid populations and aphid populations consist of two yellow pecan aphid species uh, and the later season, later in the season of black pecan aphid uh, can sometimes create problems. And that's kind of the more toxic of the three aphid species. And as well as uh, we wanted to monitor the predators and parasites of uh, these aphid critters uh, and try and develop some kind of understanding or initial, I don't know, be able to at least speculate on the dynamics of the system relative to cover crop management and then also the aphid population dynamics uh, in relation to the cover crop management. And it should be noted that we did not use a control, so there was no non-cover cropped areas. 
in this situation. Um, this is a map of the area and those little um, colored boxes. Those were the sampling locations. Uh, the cover crop was sampled every two weeks at 10 locations. So we did uh, sweep samples. We had a sweep net. We, each sampling consisted of eight 180 degree sweeps at each location. Um, sticky traps were hung in pecan canopy uh, between six and 10 feet at 10 locations. And they were changed every two weeks as well. Uh, we did weekly aphid counts and those consisted of at each one of these locations, uh, three compound leaves were taken from each of two trees. So that's a total of 60 compound leaves and all aphids and other beneficials were counted. Um, and then the grower was informed, you know, I, I tried to keep Ben and Mike uh, informed about these aphid counts because they have to make decisions uh, um, about aphid control uh, depending on what, where the economic threshold is. If the aphid populations exceed some economic threshold, uh, I'll have a graph on that later, um, then you need to typically put on some control measures. So um, on the left here, you can see that's a total of six, three leaves and three leaves. That's a, um, the leaf count sample. I use some clippers. Uh, just to the right, you can see the mason jars we used. Um, we uh, wanted to collect these insects from sweet samples and um, you know, count them. And so we ended up uh, transferring using one of these, uh, these, I guess you'd call them cones of shame. Uh, we bought it, I bought it from Petco uh, to transfer the contents of the sweep net sample into the mason jar. That worked, that's appropriate technology. Um, that worked pretty well. The mason jars then went into the cooler. There was some ice in there uh, and then into the freezer that same day uh, to kill the insects. But the cooler helps to, if you had spiders or some other predator insect in your sample, uh, the, the tendency is uh, those predators um, remain active if they're kept at uh, you know, ambient temperature. And so your sampling would be much less uh, once you, um, you know, if you let them predate on the sample for eight hours or six hours before you got back into the freezer, uh, that would skew the results. Anyway, so that's kind of the process. This is the cover crop mix. Uh, we drilled the four species in, in the green background. Uh, we broadcast eight species. Now, I understand no grower would ever do this, but uh, we wanted to make sure the seeds had every chance to germinate and bloom. And uh, the broadcast seeds were typically uh, the smaller seeds. And it, as noted at Petco, we never found any of the, the milkweed, the narrow leaf milkweed or the showy milkweed. Um, but the phacelia, crimson clover, Persian clover, and to a lesser extent, California poppy and sweet alyssum, they did uh, pretty well. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, poppy and sweet alyssum were the most common in the alley tree row interface. Uh, the tree row was sprayed with herbicides to keep down um, usually field bindweed. Uh, and uh, it, if field bindweed grows up around the sprinkler heads, you're not going to get very good irrigation. So uh, anyway, uh, so there were large patches of white clover in the alleys early on. And um, this is a picture of from April 28th last year. You can see there's a lot in bloom in this alley. And it's incredible the life that this brings in. Uh, so Facelia was an er early bloomer followed by crimson clover and Persian clover flowered after crimson clover. Um, so here's, yeah, I can't emphasize, it's truly a pleasure to do monitoring in a cover crop like this. It, it was really um, kind of fun. Um, and so this is in a different block. This is block five. So it's one of the more Eastern blocks and younger trees. But you can see here, the Persian clover has really taken over. I mean, this was a lush crop of between one and a half and two feet high. Um, let me see. 
yeah, I should note that the cover crop mix did not look the same in all blocks. So blocks three, four, and five, those are the southern blocks in that map I showed earlier, had the most vigorous cover crops. And those in blocks one and two, this is last year, um, looked more sparse. Now this year, one and two looked very, uh, had luxurious clover um, populations. Uh, so that's just, I don't know, curious. Um, and that was from seed set because we did not plant blocks one and two. That was all from uh, last year's seed set. Um, I found out uh, those northern blocks one and two had some irrigation issues last year. Um, I was talking with uh, the manager, farm manager, and um, that might have been a contributing factor to the sparseness of the block. Um, so, and this is uh, white clover. This is about two weeks after a flail mow last year. Uh, and another alley to the right there, uh, which had been flail mowed the day previous. So you can see um, compared to that really lush and vibrant cover crop in the earlier pictures, um, when you flail mow and, you know, um, the initial idea was to flail mow to about eight to 10 inches, but the, this flail mow machinery, at least th this version of it, uh, was not able to be set up for that. It, it mows at kind of a two to three inch height. And that has a real impact on the clovers. I mean, some of the clovers came back, uh, but after a second flail mow, that just knocks them back. And then you have Bermuda grass as a warm season grass that uh, does quite well in this situation. Anyway, on to aphid counts on pecan leaves or pecan leaves. Um, the red lines indicate um, the economic threshold, so uh, which is an average of 20, earlier in the year, 20 of these yellow aphids per compound leaf, an average. Uh, after August 15th, the economic threshold drops down to 10 aphids per leaf, and I think that's more for the honeydew uh, impacts than uh, real damage to the uh, pecan harvest, although Ben um, feel free to contradict me on that. But I, I just don't think there's not very much known about the impacts of sooty mold on, on the aphid, uh, not the aphid, on the pecan production. Ben, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, no, I think um, generally sooty mold's not good in the sense that it cuts off the photosynthetic process. Um, but um, I, yeah, I think you have to weigh that versus, um, especially a younger orchard uh, versus the cost of spraying. And in this case, they're beneficial. So, you know, as, as I mentioned in one of the chat is that last year we came up with the idea of spraying water <laughs> to manage the seeds. And then that way, you know, because the issue with part, there's the, in, with yellow aphids for partic in particular, the issue, primary issue, is that they don't cause uh, defoliation. And it's been our experience too, it depends on the variety. But what they do is they secrete the uh, honeydew and then dirt and everything starts getting on leaves and then the plant can't uh, you know, engage in photosynthesis so easily. So we actually just started spraying water last year and that seemed to manage it. Um, so the, the biggest issue really was that we had a really sticky harvest. So uh, that's not the most pleasant part of the harvest, but, you know, harvest can be, harvest can be kind of dirty anyhow. So, if, you know, so we're, it's a work in progress, but um, we, we don't think we are, our, our yields were impacted last year. Um, and, um, but um, what happens in trees is sometimes you don't see impacts for, a year or two after and so we'll see how our set is this year but uh you know last year you know as you know rex would play with the idea of spraying or not and given everything that was going on in the orchard we decided not to spray uh, any chemicals um so this year we plan to do the same is just use water um and just manage the stickiness of it yeah thanks ben and yeah it's really a, a pleasure and an, a real opportunity to you know, monitor these, this orchard with no insect sprays. And, uh, you know, we figure typically there would be two to three sprays for aphids over a season. And, and likely one of the sprays would be a neonicotinoid um, 
spray, which has been implicated, you know, it's a systemic insecticide. So it is absorbed by the plants and as well as the cover crop plants and uh, likely gets into the nectar and stuff. So um, it's great to be able to do this without any concern about uh, sprays other than water. Um, uh, oh, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, the sooty mold, the sooty mold does not, it grows on the leaf, but just on the, on the honeydew, it doesn't infect the leaf. It just forms this black uh, layer that uh, uh, decreases light incidence to the uh, photosynthetic uh, cells in the leaf. So anyway, um, I missed this sampling date here in the middle of that question mark. Um, if you recall last year, middle of August, there was some of the worst air quality I've ever experienced in California. And it was really triple digits as well. And um, I was not gonna sample or send my staff out to do any sampling in that kind of situation. But something interesting happened there because um, the populations went from an average of over 30 uh, per compound leaf down to something that we don't know, and then either crept down uh, at the next sampling or crept up, who knows? That's, a, that's one of those mysteries. Uh, see what happens this year. Um, wanted to cover some of the other uh, ladybird populations, or other beneficial populations. Um, see here. So there's a few things on this. Uh, these are the, the blue part of the graph is uh, ladybird beetle larva in our sweet populations. And then uh, the oranges, the, the adults. And so you can see in the shaded area, uh, those were the two mowings, right? Or the two initial mowings. So the first mowing did uh, every other row and the second mowing uh, did the rows that weren't mowed the first time and they were separated by about two weeks and i really i'm i was really pleased i have a video and some photos uh not on this presentation of the the roller that ben is using and and there was a question earlier uh it's not a roller crimper it's simply one of the rollers that uh, a lot of almond growers use and walnut growers too um, it's a smooth surfaced roller to float the orchards you know to smooth out the um the orchard floor. And um, so I think, you know, it really, now there's two, two things here. The mowing probably knocked down the ladybird beetle population, certainly in the sweep, uh, in our sweeps. It may have forced the migration into the canopy of the adult ladybird beetles. The larvae can't fly, right? But the adults can. And so maybe they just decided, you know, flail mowing, that's a bit too loud and ruckus uh, fly up into the uh, into the canopy. And to the right, that's a sample of one of our sweeps. You know, you can see a lot of dead ladybird beetle larva. There's a few adults in there. This critter right here, kind of greenish, that's a green lacewing adult. So we're responsible for a lot of um, insect deaths, but um, yeah, probably going to insect health, you know, for that. But uh, we feel it was for a good cause. So, um, so that's the ladybird beetle populations. The surfed populations uh, really didn't, in the sweeps anyways, um, they appeared much later in the season. So that's an interesting dynamic. You know, they're uh, very low in the early part of the season. And then uh, later in the season when I was doing leaf counts, um, the, uh, the, the leaves generally had a lot of honeydew on them. And I think the surfids were feeding on the honeydew, uh, as do a lot of parasitic wasps, these small micro hymenops, we call them. Uh, Hymenoptera is the order of, uh, of wasps and bees. And we, micro hymenops, there's a huge number of these small parasitoids that um, prey on small soft bodied insects or insect eggs. Anyway, um, There were very few flowering resources in the alleys by later in the season, by September. And that's why we speculate that the surfeits may have been feeding on the honeydew. The eggs and larvae were never abundant in the leaf counts I did. That um, 
picture is a larva, and this is what an adult, one of the adult um, species. There are several species of, of uh, flower flies or surfid flies in, in California. Um, but they are, they are not aphid predators. Uh, the adults are pollen feeders and or nectar feeders. Um, just the larva are uh, aphid carnivores. And so you have to have habitat for both of those um, parts of the life cycle. Um, so my new pirate bug populations, I mean, there were lots of my new pirate bugs and these are sucking insects, they're predators. They're like miniature, think of them as very, very, very miniature kind of assassin bugs. If you're familiar with assassin bugs or navid bugs, they're in the same order, um, but they're, as the name implies, pretty darn small, probably two, two millimeters, three millimeters. And the, the earlier instars, the younger ones are even smaller. But we found large populations in the cover crops early in the season. And we may have accidentally found out why. Um, in our sweeps, we had some crimson clover flower heads. And I took a close look at them. Um, and they, you know, we have some dissecting scopes. These are thrips. They were very happily feeding on the flower heads of crimson clover. But there were also, and this is just a small sampling, but there were a lot of, um, these are minute pirate bug nymphs feeding that are feeding on the thrips. So um, if, you're, if you have problems with thrips, maybe plant some um, crimson clover. I think the thrips probably would prefer crimson clover as long as it stays as in a lush state. You might invite in a whole bunch of um, minute pirate bugs to manage your thrips if you have thrips on you know, pole crops or something like that. Anyway, you can see the mowings here in the graph. Um, and they may or may not have had an impact on the minute pirate bug population, probably did, because a lot of, uh, they feed on a lot of thrips. And um, if there are no flowers, uh, you know, a lot of thrips feed on flower or flower parts. Um, Curiously, we didn't find any minute pirate bug adults in the canopy, which is, I don't know, it's one of those behaviors uh, and it's one of the more interesting pieces of information we found. There were huge numbers in the cover crop and the adults can fly, the larva or the instars, the early instars cannot fly, which is true of all the sucking insects, the uh, hemipterans and homopterans. Um, but the adults can fly and uh, chose not to fly up into the canopy. We didn't find them in the leaf counts and we did not find them in the um, sticky trap counts. So of all the populations of predators and parasites on the cover crop, spiders and what I'm calling microhymenops, which are parasitic wasps about uh, four to five millimeters or less. So that's an eighth of an inch or less uh, in size. They remained uh, most consistent throughout the season, but please note that these two graphs are not equivalent. The spiders, you know, the top um, count is 80, the microhymenoptera, the top count is 40. So um, decrease the microhymenoptera by half and you have a relative comparison. But, um, so, and I think these are important kind of um, plan B predators or parasites um, in case, the ladybird beetles and the green lacewings and the surfflies didn't um, take care of the populations. Let me see. I, uh, I want to switch to what we found in the leaf samples, and uh, this was this is a combined graph um, showing the spiders and the other minute pirate bugs, microhymenoptera, the, those levels. Um, and so I think it, it's, it kind of demonstrates in a small way, the importance of having a diverse set of predators. And you want to have a diverse set of predators because they are, they can react to different environmental conditions. Maybe this year, uh, the minute pirate bugs were really high uh, or last year, um, this is data from last year. 
but maybe next year or two years from now, um, this the minute pirate bugs will have a crash year and the spiders will just explode. Uh, so these dynamic, you know, if you provide habitat, you're providing a like a dynamic and you know pest management insurance because nature has been doing this for literally hundreds of millions of years. We're just figuring this out, but the more kind of good habitat you provide, I think uh, the more dynamic your uh, pest management response can be. Just let nature do most of the work. Um, so green lacewing eggs. Um, here's the numbers of green lacewing eggs. Please note that these numbers represent all ages of green lacewing eggs uh, that were visible. And green lacewings were one of the major predators of aphids. Now, uh, the adults are pollen feeders. The, only the larvae are aphid predators or predators on uh, soft-bodied insects. Um, they were clearly in the canopy. You can see from this, let's see, there's about six, there's a, Green lacewing, green lacewing, green lacewing, green lacewing. There's a lot of green lacewing stuck to this. There's also a brown lacewing uh, in there. They have very similar kind of life cycles and uh, predatory appetites. Um, so they were one of the major aphid controls. Um, and I was surprised, you know, here's, let's see here. This, this is probably a second instar. So, you know, insects go through essentially molts. You know, there's, uh, they hatch from the egg. Uh, certain insects uh, have these larvae that come out. Uh, um, this is like a second phase of five. So they, with each molt, they get a little bit bigger. Uh, this is a um, second instar uh, green lacewing larva. And if, if the picture was sharper, you could see these long mandibles that have impaled this adult um, black margined yellow aphid. Uh, and because the aphid outweighs it and has wings, uh, but the, uh, that little predator uh, wouldn't let it go. And so I was kind of surprised. I've seen, I saw the same thing with uh, smaller ladybird beetle larva would take on these big, uh, these big aphids and um, kind of suck them dry. So somewhat encouraging. So ladybird beetle forms uh, the top picture. That's a ladybird beetle egg mass. And we were counting egg masses. So that egg mass, even though there's something like, I don't know, um, 35 eggs in it. So counting the egg masses as just one is somewhat misleading because we were counting green lacewing um, eggs as one. Uh, adult beetles rarely remained on the leaves I sampled and the low numbers may simply be an art artifact of the leaf collection method and uh, probably could have lost significant numbers of larvae just from them simply dropping off the leaves that I collected. But you can see once these egg masses hatch, the bottom picture, uh, that's a bunch of just first, you know, first instar just hatched uh, ladybird beetle larvae. They're all black. They developed orange markings later on. And there's a little spider there that's probably going to feed on one or two of those guys. So, you know, predators predate on a lot of different things. Um, so we're conducting year two of the cover crops and hope to reduce the number of mowings um, in these cover crops because I, I think... A, you know, that has a real impact on, on uh, and, and Ben has agreed, you know, he's rolling his uh, cover crops now, not mowing. So that's, that's great. Just other things, you know, there were other predators. Uh, we found a lot of dragonflies and damselflies, mostly wings, uh, because the sticky traps, you know, they were out in the orchard for two weeks. We found feathers on them. So birds were coming to these sticky traps. It's kind of like, oh yeah, there's the yellow card buffet. And um, very rarely found the bodies of damselflies and um, dragonflies. We just found their wings. Uh, they were eaten. Um, so let me see, some conclusions, speculations. 
about this very dynamic system, uh, cover crops, they did provide significant habitat for a, uh, quite a wide range of beneficial insect species. Um, some of them, uh, most of the beneficials migrated into the canopy. Um, notably, the minor, new pirate bug did not, but all the ones other uh, did for the most part. We observed very few aphid mummies resulting from wasp parasitism. These are those uh, microhymenop. Uh, will, some of them will lay their eggs inside uh, an aphid. The egg will hatch. Larva will eat the, uh, from the inside, eat the aphid. And then the aphid exoskeleton will turn this beige color and kind of harden. And then the wasp will uh, create this small, perfectly round hatch, come out and um, start feeding on nectar and parasitizing other aphids. But we speculate that uh, because there was such a high predation rate from the generalist predators, you know, the um, lacewing larva, surfer fly larva, and the um, ladybird beetles, that there were not enough untouched aphids to provide um, really habitat, food and habitat for their larvae because they were, they were eaten by other generalist predators. So I uh, saw very few mummy, uh, aphid mummies. Um, yeah, these ladybird beetles and lacewing larvae we felt were the most effective predators, secondary predators. There were a lot of very tiny spiders and these spiders kind of hang out on the leaves for a long, long time. Um, and they collect aphids. They regularly go out on uh, predation excursions and, and uh, collect aphids. So surfed fly larva and perhaps uh, assassin bugs. We saw a few of those. Um, I don't consider them you know, like primary predators, but uh, the size of assassin bugs is quite large. And uh, if you, you know, they could eat a lot of aphids. We found only one minute pirate bug in the leaf samples, you know, the, uh, from the pecan canopy and very few in the sticky traps. So that was, that was one of the surprising um, observations. And we're now in year two of the cover crops and hope to, you know, well, the number of mowings will be reduced and they have been. Um, and we're gonna just be monitoring and hopefully reporting on this uh, in, the in the future after harvest. And then more research, I think, is needed on the impacts of pecan production, um, of honeydew impacts on uh, pecan production. And here are some pictures. This one up in the upper left, there's a very small spider, and that's like a first instar um, aphid. Uh, these are very tiny spiders, but you know this uh, spider is definitely going to have a meal here. There's probably a second instar. Uh, ladybird beetle larva in the middle upper picture feeding on a um, on an aphid. A, this is a just hatched ladybird beetle larva egg mass uh, and then there's a spider waiting for its lunch. And these are the two aphid, yellow aphid species. This is the uh, yellow pecan aphid and this is the black margin um, yellow pecan aphid. You can see the black margins along its wings. And then this is the black pecan aphid. And this critter has a much lower economic, economic threshold. You know, I think it's uh, economic threshold is one, an average of one per compound leaf because it's uh, saliva is quite toxic to um, pecan leaf cells. Here are some resources, ATRA. I've mentioned ATRA. It's a really good resource for farmers. Uh, we run also some 800 lines. Uh, Toll-free lines, you can ask any question related to sustainable or organic production or marketing of crops or livestock. Um, and these ones below are um, research is uh, similar to what we're doing, but from the Midwest, uh, looking, you know, they had slightly different focus. And then I guess that's it for me. Happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Rex. Um, really fascinating to see all this information you've gathered and especially, yeah, really interesting to see that 
some of the the populations changed you know when we had those fires last year um and just see how that even the air quality can affect you know some of the ecology happening in the orchards um so we yeah, do we have wondered some... about that emily you know right. does were aphid populations impacted by the air quality mm -hmm. who knows nobody's ever really studied that i don't think yeah could be um well we do have uh we do have some time to take questions and thank you for for sending in your questions you can go ahead and continue to submit questions for for ben and rex in the q a and i think we can move into kind of addressing some of those so one question i have um for you ben is you know, in terms of kind of the, the economic piece, um, which is a really important consideration, obviously, for most folks is, um, you know, have you seen that using cover crops in, in this pecan orchard or even more broadly, you know, with your almonds, um, how has that played out in terms of, of the economic viability of the system? Yeah, so for the almonds, um, I think it's a clear benefit in the sense that we, you know, we we're now it's about two and a half percent organic matter in our almonds, which I think was pretty good on a relative point of view. Um, our so our almond soil has some clay in it, and we actually um, put in some micro sprinklers on, on one block <coughs> to manage um, the cracking in the soil. Uh, we couldn't even harvest, um, so the cover crops helped with that, also, um, and. Um, I do believe that uh, what we'll find is that cover crops really enhance soil percolation in the soil. So not only does it uh, capture rainfall in the soil and our water holding capacity uh, makes available to um, the trees, including, you know, the carbon sequestration and organic matter. But um, I think one of the one of the things that's we're active in our local GSA or under Sigma is that my hope is, is that we can um, work towards getting some type of recharge credits for using cover crops in our orchards, even with drip, uh, because of the enhanced water percolation. And along with that, you get all the benefits of pollinator habitat and carbon sequestration and all that. So um, I, 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 that's one, uh, I think, for the almonds, I think, especially for drip lines, if you can, you know, whatever rain, you know, the biggest aquifer recharge is the rainfall that hits the soil and getting it in the aquifer where it hits the soil. And I think cover crops really is going to help. We, you know, we see that um, in our field. And, you know, even this year in our almonds on drip lines, we had four, we had some parts where we had uh, our best long-term five-year cover crop stand. And even this year we had three to four foot um, uh, uh, mustard stand, uh, and we, you know, we. Uh, I see Billy Sinks in the chat, and thank you, Billy, for all your support um, and for APSM. Um, but um, you know, I would. Um, we even had, uh, you know, part of it was like a snow. Well, it was like a snow pea mix, and in, in May I was able to pick fresh snow peas from the rain of this year, even in that field. So you can just see the water holding capacity that comes from uh, cover crops, and so. Um, so on that. So on this side, um, as I mentioned in the chat, you know, uh, EDF. You know, I'm a big proponent of uh, of like right, right, riparian areas and pollinators, and EDF came and approached. And you know, frankly, I didn't even know exactly what I was getting involved in, but it was something that I thought was going to be good. Um, and it's a younger orchard, um, and so we're coming into production, so the opportunity cost is. Uh, as high as it's going to be in the future. Um, but, um, you know, it's like you, if you don't, if there's a op that what you find, and I think especially for things that aren't well financed or have, you know, uh, every, there's so many people involved that need financing and need projects and get their PhD papers and studies and all that, is that um, the, you have to kind of seize the opportunity. So we just say, seize the opportunity. We, you know, really thought long and hard last year about whether or not we wanted to spray for aphids. And um, 
I just I kept on going and going. At one point, it was almost like uh, giving birth, you know, um, you, it may be too late to get the uh, epidural, you know, and we just went with it. And, um, and uh, you know, I don't think it impacted and we don't really, frankly don't know, but the orchard looks great this year. Um, and, um, you know, I do, there are a lot of native pecan trees around that don't get sprayed and they seem to be doing fine and our orchard looks fine so far. So, you know, after this is a three year project and maybe after next year, um, we will, um, you know, go back to being, you know, spraying, but I think we're more likely to try to transition to organics because of this experience. So um, our goal is to really kind of uh, do riparian re re restoration with a northern native, northern native North American cultivar, a pecan, and part of the hickory family, which is super adaptive and a very uh, amazing tree. And, um, uh, and and um, and get all the multi benefits that come from um, actually having trees in the riparian areas, for, and, and get food benefit too, and food production also. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it seems that oftentimes you know it depends on each case, but it can take a couple of years sometimes for that for that cover crop to to kind of see return. Sometimes it's it's sooner than that. You know, you can see benefits, but. It, uh, yeah, I, I think I think he, that's that's the point is that I think you don't you're always going to be surprised. And my sense is that you're probably not going to see the real impact for like five years, you know. And then I go back, you know, I've always been the what I know of like oh, Gabe Brown's work around organic matter. It just it, it's a cumulative and it's a, it's not a linear relationship. It's a compound relationship. Um, and you're you're building ecosystems in some cases rebuilding ecosystems and um i don't think you really can you know it, it, it's you know it, unfortunately i probably more it's just given all the pressures we have growing crops it's just but it takes the time and you're not really going to see the full cycle probably for five years and um mm -hmm. and i think we're seeing that in our almonds now um uh, and and I, I'm more of a, you know, going intuitively, I you know, orchard seems very alive, you know, and the trees look like they're doing just fine and are doing well. And, you know, and like one issue we're looking at is whether or not all that clover, all the nitrogen fixations going on that clover, is it accessible to the trees or is it taking nitrogen from the trees, you know, from the nitrogen we're adding? We frankly, we don't know at this point. We'd love to have somebody help us figure that out. We've seen some old studies that may indicate that it is a, a good benefit. I just, um, but I, I'm pretty confident that um, the trees seem pretty happy. Um, there's not too many unhappy trees out there, you know, and uh, I've seen the unhappy, you know, pecans and pecans about as tough as they get, but I think I compare, this is a pretty happy orchard. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, if you're able to avoid spraying, I think that that speaks for itself, right? Yeah, but well, we you know we don't the jury's out on that, but so far it's it's there's still happy trees this year. So mm -hmm. I think yeah. I think you know so uh, Australia um, they don't have aphids, but um, the probably the best producer of pecans in the world uh, is in Australia. Um, and I've been in Australia several times, and they they found a long time ago is that when they spray, they spray, their, they kill their beneficials, and then in Australia you get these big insect cycles, right? You know, and they paid for it a couple of years afterwards, and so um, and that you know there's a 40, 50 year old orchard there that's very productive, it's still very productive, and they've been doing it without any pesticides. So, you know, I, I, this one thing we can look at. And then, you know, the native pecan crop, uh, which is just native pecan trees, primarily in the Oklahoma area and in the Midwest, you know, they, those trees, some of those trees are probably a couple hundred years old, you know, and they're not being sprayed. So, but they don't have the aphid pressure. So, you know, so California went to go aphid. So, and then there's a lot of, there's a lot of native trees around California that seem to be doing doing pretty well too they're sticky but so we're you know you just have to make your decisions and um and, and we we're early enough into this and young enough that we can you know it, it's not a 
necessarily a bad thing. And overall, we think it's going to be a good thing, especially if we are go organics. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, a question I have for Rex that's come in is there's a couple of questions kind of coming in around, you know, whether the cover crop can serve as a host plant for pests or even if the hedgerows can. And if you have, you know, recommendations for for any cover crops or hedgerows that should be avoided. Um, and, you know, this might differ between pecans or, or almonds or walnuts, say, but um, yeah, do you, have, do you have recommendations for either what should be avoided or, or, or how to manage, um, you know, if a pest population, um, the thresh, if it gets over the thresholds, how would you manage that? Right, um, <clears throat> that's a pretty big question. And, you know, I'll answer by saying it depends <laughs> on a lot of different things. Uh, it depends on the crop you're growing. Um, you know, no ecological approach to agriculture is ever going to be like 100% or a silver bullet. Uh, but the native perennials, I think Rachel Long's uh, did a lot of work on uh, native perennials and um, their harboring of pests compared to, say, a weedy um, order of a crop or an orchard. And uh, native perennials, which all these hedgerows are, um, the cover crops are not native perennials except for Facilia, um, and that's an annual. But the, the hedgerow plants um, generally don't harbor a lot of pests, although I would caution um, pear and apple growers against including toyon, uh, which is one of the um, hedgerow plants that uh, we provided for Ben. But toyon, or called, also called Christmas berry, uh, harbors uh, fire blight, and it can host fire blight. And so apples, and to a greater extent, pears are uh, susceptible to fire blight. So you don't want to plant those in conjunction with each other. Um, yeah, and anytime you you have um, nectar and pollen resources, you're going to have some pests at a low level, um, I think, generally go to those and access those. But uh, to a greater extent, it's going to be what I call, you know, like neutral insects, which help feed a population, a diverse population that includes, you know, parasites. Uh, it can support a greater number of generalist predators like ladybird, ladybird beetles and, uh, you know, green lacewing spiders. That it just creates a more dynamic um, situation on the ground, more nectar and pollen resources that are throughout the year, even during the winter, you know, coyote bush um, flowers in kind of late fall, early winter. Um, and so anyway, uh, so there's not a one, you know, cover cropping as well as design of hedgerows is a much of an art as it is a science, I would say. Uh, you have to be flexible and consider the situation. And, um, you know, like Ben has a, like on the south side of blocks um, five, four, and three, in some locations, he has a triple hedgerow. And, um, you know, we just finished up doing this hedgerow project. Uh, I think we planted something close to 25 miles of hedgerows around the state of California over the last few weeks have been planted. Um, and so you want to get irrigation on them because this is a hot season and um, you want to get mulch on them. And if, uh, so mulch is pretty important to suppress weeds as well as, um, you know, conserve soil moisture because, you know, this is a dry period. Uh, but weed, weed suppression is, is really important for establishing the hedgerows. So that's kind of a waffly answer to your question, but um, yeah, the only thing I would avoid would be toyon at this point, um, unless you know you want to understand the structure of the hedgerow plant too. You know, elderberry can get quite large, uh, flannel bush can get quite large. So you know, understand what the final kind of adult structure of that plant will be, and will that fit into your system um, wherever you put it. Thank you. Thanks, Rex. 
I think we have time just for about one more question. We've had so many questions come up and we're coming to the end of our time here, but one question, um, you know, that I think Ben or Rex, you could answer is, was the cover crop chosen in the mix solely for, for uh, habitat for beneficials and pollinators? Or was there any consideration for soil health? It looks like you had some grasses in there as well and oats and different things that can, can break up the soil. So yeah, if you could address that, what were the considerations around, you know, making this um, cover crop mix? Well, um, I'll talk first uh, and then, you know, Ben pitch in whenever you want. Uh, I think because EDF was very concerned about monarch habitat, we wanted to provide good uh, habitat, you know, nectar and pollen resources, as well as larval habitat, you know, the narrow leaf milkweed planting those seeds, <laughs> which didn't work as well as we'd hoped. Um, you know, you need uh, habitat for both of those um, life cycle components. And um, so that was a big consideration, but we also want you know, Russ Lesser and also Ben has a pretty good rap on the multifunctionality of cover crops. It's not just uh, pest management. It's not just uh, nutrient management or supplying nitrogen. It's general soil health. And there's a lot of, a lot of nuance to that. And there's a lot of, we don't know everything about soil health, but I think, you know, build it and um, they will come. Uh, we provide habitat for the microorganisms in the soil at a better habitat than what would normally be provided in a like a bare alley. And uh, it'll provide, I think, a lot of surprising results, most of them positive. You know, maybe there are going to be some negative surprises, too, because that's the way nature works. Yeah. So I would just say diversity is good in, in, in soil also. Um, so having a diverse cover crop, and I think it's one of the challenges if, you know, if you do clovers all the time, you know, maybe, I mean, I, I'm just amazed at clover right now, you know, but uh, I, and I'm hoping to get the next fixation. So, um, but um, uh, one, one thing about that is that we stay, it emerges early and actually overtook a lot of the Bermuda grass. And so it kind of was like a real pollinator haven that uh, actually er gets a good early start. And if you can find a way to get that, uh, depending on your tree, you know, maybe in some walnut orchards, I think it might be harder in some almond orchards given those crop cycles, but where you can get that to go to seed, that would be a real uh, thing to look at. But um, I think the big thing is that you really, there's a lot going on, on top of the ground, you know, pollinating habitat and, and all that organic matter on top of the ground, but probably just as important, maybe more important is the roots. And the diversity in roots, and then the day, and the, and then the time series of that roots. So, you know, having ten years of roots, and eight years of roots, and nine years of roots, it just uh, is a continuous feed for the microbial population. I, I just think we just have not focused enough on soil health and soil structure that comes from you know microbial field so feeds and uh, microbial life. You know, so you know we talk a lot about like. Uh, uh, you know, feed stock, you know, we need to get more feed stock for microbes, it, just generally in California. Um, and they are our biggest, you know, our biggest kind of, a, you know, beneficial um, organism in the soil. And, and, and then, and then um, the other issue of pecans in particular is that it has relationship, mycorrhizal relationship with both types, the ecto and endo mycorrhizae. So there's just a lot going on. And, and, uh, Soil with roots, cover crop, you need cover crops for roots, and soil with roots is our future, you know, in California. And that's the way it was before we started irrigated agriculture. And uh, what's great about irrigated agriculture is that we can, you know, promote more root development uh, in, our, in, our, in our orchards too. So um, I think diversity and, and just getting, getting stuff in the soil itself. Well said. And yeah, just leave it at that. All right. Yeah, I appreciate that point too about, you know, it's what's uh, the community underground, right? The root structures and having that diversity is so important too. Um, 
So with that, it looks like we're just about out of time. And thank you for all the questions that have come in. We, we haven't been able to get to all of them, but I appreciate Rex and, and Ben, both of you being here today and, and sharing your experience and your expertise. It's really fascinating to learn more. And um, I'd also like to thank some of the other partners in the, the TA hub, um, specifically Calusa RCD for helping to facilitate some uh, connections here today. And also to the uh, California Association of Resource Conservation Districts for helping make today possible. Thank you um, also to you know, all of our TA Hub partners. And if you'd like to get in touch with us to get plugged into the Hub, you can get in contact via ecological farming at calf.org. I think Rose is gonna pop that in the, the chat so you can reference that. And uh, we can you know, connect you with a, a local, someone in your area who's able to kind of help out um, address questions, provide some resources around figuring out the best way to implement things like cover crops, um, you know, find cover crop seed, that kind of a thing. And not, not even just cover crops, also, you know, things like if you're looking to reduce your tillage or, or move towards no-till or um, source hedgerows, that kind of thing, you know, we're happy to help out in any way we can. And also stay tuned for more events like this one. We're gonna be having another online event next month and um, hope to have some in the field as well here soon. So just stay tuned, we'll be sending out some more information as well as some follow-up resources. And uh, yeah, if you've enjoyed this event, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a couple minutes. Uh, we have like a feedback form and we'd love to hear you know, what you've liked about uh, this event today as well as ways that we could improve and um, that would, you know, that helps us to continue to have events like this to, to bring everybody together. So once again, um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And thank you to our speakers, Ben and Rex. Appreciate having you here and looking forward to connecting with y'all in the future. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.